Well, good morning, everybody joining us. Appreciate you guys attending. Um, first and foremost, uh, uh, I hope everybody's safe and taking care of your family and uh, hopefully your businesses and work and everybody will come back up and flourish when this thing gets lifted, but um, God bless you all. Um, Dennis, and, Dennis Burrell and myself, I'm Ken Adent, uh, started this just because we love to talk football. And I think Dana can attest to that. And we do have uh, two members of the NMA with us, Dusty Young and Dana Pattles. Um, we'll get to Dana in just a moment, but uh, we do want to announce a couple of upcoming speakers, uh, guest speakers that we have. Dennis, do you want to give us the names and the uh, dates, please? Yeah, so uh, this week on um, Tuesday, we'll have Pac-12 referee, uh, formal umpire Frank Villar that will be on Tuesday at six on Wednesday. Um, we'll have another Pac-12 umpire on Wednesday night at six. Uh, Roscoe and on Thursday will be the Division Two RMAC. And did you figure out your uh, audio problems That's from right. Monday? Hey Todd, mm -hmm. mutual support. Could you guys could it, could it, could everybody please turn off your cameras and mute? I told you what happened. Everybody right? mute your computers and turn off your cameras. And then on so on Thursday we have uh, Mike Contreras that will talk to uh, to the group at six p.m. on Thursday, and then next Saturday will be NFL referee Brad Rogers uh, giving us another talk. Okay. Uh, thanks for joining us. Uh, Mr. Land Clark looks like he's logged on. Uh, Dana. Yes, D Dana Pappas, could you please introduce our guest? I surely will. Uh, good morning, everybody, and thank you for joining us on this uh, fine Saturday morning. It is exciting to have the special guest on on the phone. Um, I've been fortunate enough to know Land the entire time I've worked at the Anime A office and. Um, I'm not doing a real formal introduction. I think it's more of a, a personal one. Um, Land, of course, worked collegiate football in both Mountain West and in the Pac-12. He was a referee in the Pac-12, and I think he called a bowl game pretty much every year that he was a collegiate official. He did call the national championship between Alabama and Notre Dame, and for those of you who watched that game, the most exciting part of it was that Land was the referee. Um, it was it was not much of a game, but it was certainly exciting to see Land um, on that stage. Um, Land, of course, is in the NFL. He's entering his third season in the league and was just promoted, I believe, within the last week to the position of referee. Um, one of the things that I think is important to remember about Land really has nothing to do with his officiating resume, which is absolutely impressive, but. Land is one of the most humble individuals that you'll ever meet. Um, he's absolutely extraordinary when it comes to his football knowledge, and he's absolutely forgotten more about the sport than many of us will ever know. But Land has continually paid it forward and ensured that he gives back to the little guy, which would be all of us. Um, he always wants to help. He always wants to, to give back, and he's always looking for ways to stay involved with the high school officials. Um, one of the things about Land is a number of years ago, I used to have Land do a lot of film breakdown for us. A number of years ago, he called me at the end of the season. I was like, well, why don't you send me a film? And this was right when you got into the league, and I was pretty sure that he had bigger fish to fry. But He's uh, a man without ego, and he's somebody who is just a, kind of an icon of officials here in the state of New Mexico and a great friend uh, to me personally and to the, the New Mexico Officials Association. He comes and speaks every year at Ken Murphy's camp here in Albuquerque and is just a true asset to the New Mexico Officials Association, New Mexico Activities Association. 
Um, and definitely, I, I am a fan and I'm hoping for a fall season in the NFL so that we can all see Land doing his thing on the on the big stage. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce a good friend of all of ours, uh, Mr. Land Clark. Thanks, Dana. I hope everybody can. I'm, uh, yeah, shutting up everybody else in the, um, uh, in this uh, new uh, odd reality we're we're in, I, uh, I hope everybody's safe. Um, so, uh, Ken asked me to talk about whatever I wanted to, and he gave me a few of so what I decided to do was just kind of lump them all together. That is something that I feel is probably the most important part about officiating. Uh, and that is game management. Uh, you know, those of you who have heard me speak before, you know, th this is kind of the bread and butter. So if, if I can figure out how to do this, I'll try to share the screen. Somebody can turn this over to me. So, yeah, um, can you hear me, Land? Dennis, are you helping him out? And uh, please, everybody, turn off your microphones. Thank you. Everybody seeing that uh, PowerPoint now? No, hold on. Yes, sir. We got you. Yep, we got it. Perfect. So it's, I think, you know, it's more than just your calls. I, I know uh, all of us, you know, as soon as the game is over, if we can get the video, we get the video and we're looking at, you know, that pass interference or that holding call. Uh, make sure we got it right, uh, but football officiating is just more than that. It's, it's how we manage the game and how we uh, you know, deal with players, deal with coaches, uh, in a lesser degree, deal with fans. That is the most important uh, you know, quote here from uh, Tom Landry. You know, and I, I think it's true. I mean, you sure? yeah. We uh, we're always looking for that big call, and I think you know if, if that comes your way, you get to call it. That's great. Uh, but uh, I had uh, a, a Big Twelve referee call me a long time ago, and it made a lot of sense. Don't let great get in the way of good. And uh, there's there's a lot of uh, millionaires in the NFL who are quote game managers at QB, and that's I think a lot of what we need to be is is managers because you know the game is yours, and if you manage it well, uh, everybody's okay. We're gonna miss calls. We're gonna miss pass interference. We're gonna miss a clip. Maybe maybe even a safety foul. That that's. You know, that's just going to happen. It happens to us in real time from one angle. Things are going to get away from us. But uh, if we look good doing it and manage it on the field, we still have credibility and the game is going to go okay. So, uh, you know, dealing with coaches, I think, is an, an important part of that. I know, I don't know if there's any coaches in the room, but. Um, it, it's a tough job, and I, I think as officials, we kind of look at coaching through our perspective, which is flawed. We uh, we spend a lot of time doing this officiating deal, but it's not nearly what they spend. And uh, so, uh, just just to realize that when you go out there uh, and shake that referee's hand. And introduce yourself. There's an exchange of power there uh, that uh, that coach, who for the previous week is in charge of everything, when the players get up in the morning, what they eat for breakfast, the meetings they go to, uh, the workouts, the practices. He is the king, and then when he shakes your hand, he's given that up to you 
to manage that football game. And uh, he's not liking it much. And that's just a fact. So uh, kind of keep that in mind and be cognizant of that. You're dealing with somebody who's not used to that position. So make sure you uh, are sensitive to that, that reality. Uh, these individuals, this is their, their life. This is, you know, many of them, it's all they do. Uh, so yeah, they're gonna be biased. They're not gonna, they're not gonna worry about fair. They're not gonna worry about uh, you know, what's, even what's right or wrong. These, they have a, a, an emotional interest in all these players and certainly in the, in the game. So yeah, they're, they're gonna have a slant that's, that's all, at times not even rational, but that's okay. Uh, but if you understand that, uh, you can kind of be a, a little bit, uh, uh, it's a little bit easier to deal with and you can, you can help them through some of those uh, contentious discussions if you if you look at it through their eyes um, and realize that a lot of time coaches they're just venting you know they're upset because the, the play didn't work or that uh, individual player did foul and now they're backed up so recognize that sometimes the coach is just venting and sometimes the coach is using you to, uh, to motivate players. I think we've uh, all kind of seen that when a, a coach will just lose his mind and it doesn't really make sense. Well, it may not make sense to you, but that demonstrative interaction with you, he may be looking to fire up his team that he thinks is you know, maybe playing a little flat or uh or not trying hard so again look at it from their perspective it makes it a little bit easier to deal with um and remember it's not personal it, it really isn't it's uh it's not about you it's you know most of these you know some of you know coaches pretty well but that's kind of the exception where you know we show up uh on game day, we spend a couple hours together, but you know the rest of the time uh, we we don't know who these people are. So it, it kind of comes with the job. You you get the bad polyester suit and the target on your back. And, uh, they're going to take some stuff out on you, and as long as it's not personal, it's it's not personal. But when it gets personal, uh, that's uh, that's a problem. I think. Uh, you know, we can we can let a coach vent and we can let him yell and but when it when that sentence begins with you uh, then then we gotta draw a line because that tends to snowball the teams hear it the other coaches hear it and uh, and it, it it can get out of hand And uh, I don't know about any of you, but I've been doing this a while and I have never come to a coach when he's upset and he <coughs> what I called and he looks me in the eye and says, okay, Land, yeah, you're right. It, it, it just doesn't happen. So it's okay to agree to disagree and just say, okay, coach, that's what I saw. That's what I called and uh let the let the video justify your call don't try to convince anybody of anything mostly because sometimes the video will tell you you're wrong so uh just uh you know just agree to disagree and that's okay um, but as long as you're interacting with the coach and it's it's professional it'll mostly go okay you try to ignore them and it's just like your spouse they just start talking louder so uh, just deal with them some of you are very very good communicators and you can have those uh, sometimes even heated discussion with coaches it's aren't quite that good so uh, i think my best communication often with the coach is i nod my head 
I look at him, make eye contact, nod my head, yeah, coach, I got you, and, uh, and, and move on. Because oftentimes, he's just looking to be heard. And then uh, recognize that uh, it's the whole game. It, it's from you know, the time we step out onto the field <coughs> and, and until we get back into the into the bus or the or the car to go home, uh, beginning in 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 the pregame. And yeah. one thing I think we all need to be re cognizant of is perception is reality. You know, eyes are always on us. I don't care if you're working a, a freshman game uh, on uh, Milne 2 or you're working a big high school game on Friday night or, or what. People are, are always looking at you. Uh, you know, this is just for instance, uh, this uh, shot. Um, you see here that uh, person right there is Bill Levy. He is the uh, referee uh, supervisor in the NFL. Adrian and I are going around doing our pregame thing, and uh, we're being watched. You never know, and it doesn't really matter whether it's a supervisor or another coach or, or just a fan. I just remember you were always on. Your credibility starts the minute you walk outside with that striped shirt. So uh, just you're on stage, so uh, play the part. Uh, during the pregame, always open the lines of communication uh, before the contention. You know, if that first conversation you have with the quarterback or uh, Know, the defensive captain or a coach or, or or anybody if that first conversation is after you've thrown a flag that's probably not going to go nearly as well as if you uh, talked before i always talk to players and coaches before the game try not to get in the way uh, but i do want to you know a, a quick introduction especially as a referee i'll introduce myself to uh, to both quarterbacks let them know if they need anything, let me know. If they want to discuss something further, absolutely. Uh, if they want to go back to work, I let them go back to work. Uh, so, but that helps uh, your perception uh, from the people, also helps you. I mean, if you just go out there and stand with your hands in your pocket and uh, that very first uh, play from scrimmage, something happens, you're not going to be ready. So go out there. Uh, watch some football. Watch them warm up. Uh, I think it'll it'll help your game. Probably the you know the the biggest time we're uh, we're evaluated on game management is foul administration. This is when everybody quits looking at us. Or quits looking at the game and starts looking at us. So uh, we need to be sharp. Uh, it begins, you know, the minute we we throw that flag. Actually, it begins even before that. Uh, I know in the high school ranks, uh, you guys aren't crude, and even in the small college, it kind of mixes up a little bit. But regardless of how often you call together. Make sure you agree as a crew what needs to be called. Um, you know, I don't. Nobody comes to a football game to to watch a, a bunch of middle-aged people in, in uh, black and white suits, you know, throw penalties and talk about it. So let's make sure those fouls have meaning in the game, and and because a lot of times we can be technically correct, but some of those technical Correct calls kind of get rid of in the mess up the flow of a football game. So uh, throw what you need to throw. Now, if it means something, absolutely. That's why we're out there to balance that. Uh, and you know, players are, are looking for an edge. And uh, to 
we need to level out that playing field uh, when it comes to fouls. But again, we're going to miss some of these. We're going to get a lot of them right. I don't. Uh, average uh, football official just has no idea how hard it is what you do. It's, it's a tough job, uh, but you're going to get you know 95 percent of them right, and uh, you know if the people who work for you in your regular job were that accurate, you would probably be okay with it. Uh, we're expected to be right 100 percent of the time, so. Uh, so remember, it, it uh, starts before, but then when that flag comes out, uh, we really got to tighten it up. And we may get the foul right or wrong. That really doesn't matter. But the administration of a penalty, there is no excuse to screw that up. There's three, four, five, six, seven, eight of you out there, and it's everybody's responsibility. So, uh, you know, if if a crew screws up a penalty enforcement, costs the team a game, you're all probably going to get sat down. And if you really want to uh, give your career over to some idiot in a white hat, you're just not very bright. Uh, you know, take ownership, uh, help them out. It, uh, you know, this is my deal. I, I think of, of, uh, Foul administration is like shooting free throws. You do it the same way every time, regardless whether it's a, a false start or you know a double with and a double after, and there's you know there's twelve flags on the field. Uh, because if you do it the same way, it becomes almost muscle memory. So you know make sure there's a flag at the spot of the foul. There is we you get a football and you set it on the grass. Uh, at the end of the run, if it's a kick, we've got a bean bag at the end of the kick. And of course, the previous spot is uh, is static, and uh, hopefully, I can figure out. Uh, how to, well, I'll illustrate this in the next slide. But uh, let's so hold that thought. Uh, we'll report to the referee. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, you know. Every referee does wants files reported to them differently. Uh, but whatever way that is, if they look good, you look good. So help your help yourself look good and give it to them the way you, you want it. Uh, Adrian Hill, uh, first year referee in the league this year. Uh, and I've refereed for quite a while in college. He wanted actual uh, over the, the radios, over the official to official, wanted the, the number called out during his announcement, which was incredibly hard for me to do because if you're on my crew and you talk while I'm announcing, I will kill you. <laughs> I got enough voices in my head. I don't need yours. But that's what he wanted. So I tried very hard uh, to, to do it. And when, when he got that, that number, he... Uh, he was better, so we were better. So do whatever they want uh, because it'll make uh, you look better. You know, there's there's a, a basic rule that I don't think we we really spend a lot of time on, but it, it, it just looks so horrible if a referee has to come back to you to ask you something. It looks like the whole crew doesn't know what they're doing. So always let the referee turn away from you first. I know it's a small thing, and I know your adrenaline's going because that's a big, big call, and you're thinking about it, and you know, and that uh, that plays on a wheel, and it's going round and round in your head. So you're excited, and you want to write it down and get that description, uh, so you, you get that great grade. But you know, slow down. Speed kills when it comes to penalty enforcement. You got to be efficient, but if you start hurrying, that's when we mess it up. So uh, let let the referee turn away from you, uh, and then you can go about your business. Uh, always help with uh, numbers. However, referee wants to help help with numbers. 
I do a pretty good job with one number. You get me past that and, and I'm out because I don't want to be so worried about worried about three numbers that I point the wrong way. So I look for help, but however your referee wants that, uh, you know, if you have the radios, that's obviously uh, uh, an efficient way. But uh, if you got to stand in front and yell, everybody knows what's happening. We're not telling anybody, so it's it's okay. And as long as we get it right, we look good. Uh, penalties administered right. We are golden. Coaches' options. You know, this is a. Uh, we we've gotten so good at this uh, over the last several years about just enforcing the the obvious penalty. However. What that has led to is that coaches aren't used to dealing with option. So talk about it in your crews. You know, if you've, uh, you know, it's third and 10 and they throw a touchdown pass and there's offensive holding. Well, obviously we're going to mark off the holding. That's just a no brainer. But as a, a sideline official, go tell the coach what you're going to do. Because then he's used to you on a foul coming to him and talking to him. So that way, if it's, you know, uh, if it, well, I mean, not something that's uh, NFL specific, but if you've got, uh, let's say you've got uh, uh, defenses lined up in the neutral zone, I think that's consistent. Uh, and they, and they gain six yards. Well, if he's used to come, you coming at him on penalties, even when there's really no option, it's not going to be a surprise when you say, "Hey, coach, you went first and uh, and five or second and four. And he's again, he's used to that. He's going to make a decision. I don't know why he's probably going to have to ask somebody upstairs because maybe. The air is better up there and they can make better decisions. I don't know, but they always do it. However, uh, it will uh, help you be a, a little bit uh, more efficient. And uh, lastly on this, again, whether it's a false start or an easy penalty enforcement, always go through your verification process. Have the umpire go to the spot, give uh, whether it's a 5, 10, or 15, however the crew would like to do that, march it off together, and never, ever put the ball on the ground until everybody's good. Because if you bend over, pick up a football, and move it somewhere else, somebody knows you don't know what you're doing. You can stand there and wander around with it for quite a bit. Nobody cares. But you go back to a football and pick it back up. Uh, it's it's uh, it's no secret you've made a mistake. So take, in that case, take your uh, take your time, make sure you're right, and everybody uh, checks off on where that penalty is enforced from and to. You're on it. And then uh, clock status every time. Get together, however you want to do it. Verify the clock status. Uh, you go through great pass interference call. You nail the enforcement. Um, you know, it's just you, you do everything right. You you put it at the right spot, and uh, you you forget to wind the clock or you wind it when you're not supposed to. And the Greg Sanchez, that's you. We have several people who. Have their microphone on. Sorry, Lamb. Go ahead.
Land, you're muted. How's that? Okay, you're good. Much better. Okay. Thank you. Uh, so uh, let's say we snap at the 30. We've got a down box that says third down over there at the sideline. And uh, let's just say, uh, you know, we've got a run around this, this side and uh, they're down at the, at the B45. So this is the end of the run. Sometime during that penalty, uh, or sometime during that uh, run, we have a penalty. Uh, let's say we've got a, right here, we've got an 08. Well, if we're doing this all in the abstract, it's hard to piece that together. I think most officials are visual people. So if I've got a flag down here at the spot, and I set a football down, at the end of the run, I know where the previous spot is. It is completely obvious to everybody what we're doing. So there's been a preliminary signal of holding on the offense. It is a it is a piece of cake to officiate. Uh, conversely, same kind of play. We'll start here at the 30, third down. Run here ends at the 45. Forgive me, it's hard to write on this thing. And we have an OH on the B45. Spot a foul. So we've got a foul down on 145, a football sitting on the other 45, the previous spot's the 30. Uh, we know we're going from the end of the run and we mark it off. It, it, it is just so simple if you have that visual. But to have that visual, you've got to do it every time. To get into that rhythm and to, uh, to make sure you're consistent. Because when now you've got that same play, but you've also got uh, roughing the passer, and you've got uh, you, you know, you, you've got a defensive hold. Well, now again, if we have flags down in the right place, ball down at the end of the run, then it's just administrating, and we've got a, a clear image in our mind about where we're going from and where we're going to. Make sense. Okay, other things that I think are important to uh, game management. Uh, many of you don't have replay, but uh, you know, a few of you do. Uh, this is a an important time uh, to, to make sure you get it right. I won't spend a lot of time on replay because I know many of you don't have to deal with it. Thank goodness. Hopefully we don't have to deal with it and pass interference anymore. Mm -hmm. That was a challenge, but um, it's just, it's, it's a whole lot like penalty enforcement. Do it the same way, do it consistently, make sure the whole crew's involved in, uh, in that uh, process so that when you come out of it, everything's communicated, we get the plate, uh, going and uh, they quit looking at us and start watching what they came there for and that's uh, that's the watch football uh, measurements uh, many years ago I, I had a game uh, in, uh, in the big Ten uh, tough game great atmosphere it was that uh, 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 Texas Tech and uh, you know, we had some we had some really tough calls and we got a lot of them right, and we, we missed a couple of them, but uh, just it's a really good good game. And uh, Mr. Anderson called me afterwards and uh, said great game, and then proceeded to tell me how we butchered an uh, a measurement. He 
because it looked bad, and it did. I mean, we had players in the way, and we had to stretch the chain twice uh, because it, it it takes away from your credibility if you uh, if you are fumbling around out there. Um, I hope this picture is is blurry enough so you can't tell who's who, other than Joe Larue because you can see his number, but uh, he's doing okay. But you see that uh, that uh, posture by that umpire. You know he's got his hands in his pockets. You know, veteran official. He, you know he's done this a thousand times, but it it doesn't look good. So mm -hmm. whether it be a measurement, whether it be uh, you know spotting the football, uh, ball mechanics, any of those things. Just remember you are you are on stage. We are all as officials, uh, actors in this production. So uh, don't don't get out of character. Because people see that. Uh, most don't appreciate it. We are not professional at that. Timeouts. I, I know it's usually a great time to sort of, you know, take a breath and relax. But uh, you know, certainly you don't have to be as dialed in as you do for those six to eight seconds during the play, you still have to be dialed in. And, uh, you, know, you relax your body posture and or you're just you know, goofing around with, a, with uh, another member of the crew, people see that. Very serious to a lot of people, needs to be serious to us. That's not to say we can't have fun out there and smile. That's, that's not what I mean. I just mean that we always look and act professional because it's part of managing the game. Uh, Halftime as well. We live in an age where everybody's got a video camera in their pocket and uh, we running off the field or walking back on the field, you know, we're doing something stupid or saying something stupid. There's a very, very good chance that uh, somebody has that on tape, so just don't put yourself in that position. Make sure you manage the locker room. I know that sounds a little odd, but you know, if there are people wandering in and out of there, which they certainly always are on the on the higher levels, people coming in and coming out, well, that's that's okay to a point. If you need to have a discussion with the crew about a, a call or a situation or a coach, uh, make sure you're the only people in there. It is vital if towel guy doesn't hear you, somebody on the crew complain about what a coach said. Because you know what? That's getting back to him. So uh, manage that uh, as well. Uh, you know, I talked a little bit about clocks at uh, penalty enforcement, but that's every down. Uh, it's everybody's responsibility. You know, if you, you call a perfect game, but let you know two minutes run off the clock, you're, you're that crew that didn't know what they were doing. I know clock operators can be challenging at times. Uh, if 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 you work with them and are constantly vigilant, reset tend to embarrass them. They, you know, they'll put down that hot dog and, and the soda pop and, and maybe actually watch the football game. So just, just stay on it. Uh, you're not going to make them great if they're not very good, but uh, you can make them better if you continue to work it. And, uh, you know, I, I think this all, to, to wrap this all up, it, it's all about the, the passion of the game. A lot of you have been doing this for a long time, comes pretty natural to you, kind of just jump into it and do a great job. But, you know, if, if you have the passion to get better every game, uh, you will. If you don't, you're probably getting worse. Those players stay about the same age. We get a little older. So practice all the time. You know, when, when you're out running around on the grass, 
think about football and how you run during a football game. You're you know, just doing those scrimmages, do them like it's a playoff game. You practice that way, and you play that way. Many of you have heard me uh, speak of uh, seen this quote. I, uh, I believe it completely. I've I've never considered myself the, the smartest or the, or the fastest or uh, or, the, or the best, uh, but uh, I refuse to be outworked because if uh, if I keep working and keep uh, trying to uh, to improve, I'll be I'll be better than I was last game. Sometimes uh, I was okay. Sometimes I wasn't very good. But I'm always looking to uh, to get better, and I think if we all take that approach, we will get better. Uh, once again, uh, thanks for this opportunity. Thanks, Ken, uh, and certainly Dana for that uh, great uh, introduction. Dana and I go go way back, and uh, she's been a huge advocate for officiating in New Mexico, and you all owe her a debt of gratitude. So with that, uh, I don't know how well it'll work in a conference, but uh, if, uh, if you have any questions, uh, uh, let me know. Man, that was all fantastic stuff. I know we all have a question. Let's limit it to a couple. And if everybody can continue to mute their microphones, um, Lan, I just have a question about your conditioning. You're obviously in great shape. Can you just tell us a couple of things on what you do. Uh, well, I uh, um, um, I do. Uh, I work out a lot because I'm. I have a little uh, OCD problem. But, um, <laughs> you know, my. Uh, my in-season routine is um, get home from a game, usually either late uh, uh, Sunday night or early Sunday morning, uh, go to work. But after work, you know, I'll do a, a recovery run and then usually some, uh, you know, some leg work. Tuesday mornings, uh, lift, uh, Tuesday, uh, Afternoon, do some, uh, uh, you know, more cardio, uh, bike or elliptical, something easy on the knees. Uh, Wednesday, lift, uh, morning, Wednesday night, do some football stuff, you know, speed drills, those kind of things. Um, uh, Thursday morning, lift, uh, Thursday afternoon or evening, uh, I take it off, uh, take a little break. Go out with my wife, uh, uh, some church stuff, and uh, Friday morning lift again. Uh, Friday night do some light football stuff to to keep uh, uh, loose. So usually fly out Saturday morning, uh, try to get to the hotel, uh, work out a little bit, stretch out a lot, and uh, and do a little uh, stationary bag these kind of things. And then uh, hopefully Sunday I'm. Uh, I'm feeling good and be able to run around a little bit. <clears throat> okay, um, Lan, we have one question that was put in the chat. It's more towards a, a rule, but uh, let's go ahead and try to answer it more of a philosophy. Oh. Um, if you like, <laughs> more of a philosophy. Okay. Of, of, uh, and I'll read it to you. What What is the rule of thumb on the blindside block, especially on full action plays like kick returns, et cetera? It seems like we always get heat from one coach about whether or not the the player saw someone coming. Well, I'm probably not the guy to talk about high school rules because, quite frankly, I don't know them anymore. Uh, but uh, you know, I, I can tell you in the NFL, it's it's not it probably as difficult as as it is at uh, at the high school. Because uh, we don't care if if you're paying attention and can see them coming or not. If it's parallel or back, 
to your goal line, it, it's, a, it's a blindside block. So that's a safety foul. So, I mean, I would just, because it's, it's, believe it or not, it's hard to tell whether it's uh, parallel or back. So, it, you know, if, if, some, if a kid gets blown up, I, I would call, call it. If, if he can see him coming and can brace him to, uh, you know, avoid, avoid the contact, it's probably, uh, it may not be. Right. And I think I think the big thing in the high school rule is uh, was he leading with the hands or not? Because there still is the legal blindside block, but you have to lead with your hands. So, uh. yeah, good point. And that's that's the same. Uh, you know, it's got to be shoulder, head, forearm for us. So, yeah, if he uh, puts his hands out and you know gives him a big sh shove and, you know, he goes head over over feet and it's just a big train wreck, that's still legal. Thank you. Talk to us about your promotion to referee, please. What, uh, how is your weekly preparation going to change, or are you looking forward to it? Uh, definitely looking forward to it because I, I think I'm a lot uh, better referee than I am a field judge. But uh, <clears throat> um, yeah, I uh, I'm very excited. It's uh, you know, as a referee, it's it's a lot the same preparation because you know you asked about my. Uh, my workout routine, but also that, that two or three hours a day that I'm spending, you know, going over rules and, and going over video. Well, that probably doubles uh, now uh, from a white hat uh, perspective. But uh, you know, it's it's uh, it, it's it's an honor. I mean, there are 17 of us in the world, and I have just been blessed to end up as one of them. And you know. Those of you who you know know me for a while, I saw Mickey and a few other people on the, on the line. You know, my my path was not normal, I guess. Uh, it kind of <laughs> uh, a little uh, little delayed for a lot of reasons, and uh, uh, I kind of got into certainly the NFL late and didn't expect to uh, rise to the referee, but time and circumstances. So you, you got to be ready. That's that, yeah, that's that's my advice. I, I, I tell I've told the story a lot. Many of you may have heard it. And when I got into the Mountain West, I was hired by Bill Levy. And if you weren't six foot tall and flat stomached and, and could run, you weren't getting in. That's just that's just the way it was. Uh, but uh, right after that, uh, Ken Rivera was the supervisor. And, uh, you know, then a bunch of, you know, kind of shorter, maybe not so uh, slim guys were getting in. So, you know, it's, uh, it's time and circumstances. So, you know, just do your best and, and hopefully it'll work out. And it certainly has worked out for me. Uh, does somebody want to jump in with another question before we wrap it up with Lance? Uh, Dana, do you have anything, anything you want to say, Dana? Um, yeah, I, I typed a little note to everybody. I hope that everybody took good notes. Um, you can't you can't get this information for free usually, so um, I really hope everybody got something out of this because I know I took about six pages of notes myself. But Land, I just want to say thank you so much. Um, and I've told a number of people of this since I learned of your promotion. No one in the world deserves this more than you do. Um, it, it's your humility. It's your commitment to the the avocation at, at our level, the profession at your level. Um, and, and we just, you know, we appreciate the fact that you've never forgotten where you came from. And uh, not everybody advances to the next level and keeps at that level of a head. So you're certainly an example, not not just when it comes to football knowledge and physical conditioning and all of that, but when it comes to just keeping a good head on your shoulders and, and not forgetting your roots and you know, your your humility is, is top notch. And I just, you know, I thank you so much for everything you've done for the NMOA. And uh, I, I think we're all celebrating your your promotion. So thank you so much, and we'll continue to to look to you. And uh, you know, definitely, we're looking forward to watching you 
with that NFL white hat on this season and keeping keeping hope that there is a season. So thanks thanks again for everything and um, everybody that's on this uh, webinar. Just know, and Land, I'm sorry, I'm throwing you under the bus here, but Land is always approachable and always willing to help in any way possible. He's uh, he's never gotten too big for us, so I appreciate that. And uh, Land, thank you again. Thank you, Dana. Dan, thank you for joining us. Um, really, really appreciate it. Guys, before you get off, Dennis has our upcoming lineup. If you could uh, listen to him for just a moment, we've got some good uh, guests coming on our program here in the next week or so. Yeah, so I don't know how we're gonna, I don't know how we're gonna follow uh, a talk from Land, but we're gonna give it a shot. On Tuesday, 6 p.m., we'll have Frank Villar, newly promoted uh, referee in the Pac-12. He'll be talking about the umpire position. On Wednesday, uh, we'll have another Pac-12 umpire, Roscoe, um, on, and he'll be talking umpire stuff also. Thursday, 6 p.m., Mike Contreras, which is retired center judge from the Big 12. He's the RMAC coordinator. And then next Saturday will be the NFL uh, referee, Brad Rogers. Um, and then we'll go from there and see how this uh, Corona lockdown takes us into uh, the end of April and May. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, look forward to seeing you again. Stay healthy. God bless. Thanks, Lyle. Oh, thank you guys. Good to go. Thank you guys. If anybody wants to stay around and talk some football for a few minutes, we'll, we'll still stay on. Boy, the amount of knowledge that man has is unbelievable. So, Ken, I'll have to ask uh, <clears throat> Brad Rogers or kind of share this uh, next week too when he's on. But back when I was in college, I did a, you know, one season we had a, you know, low level, you know, AF2 team out there in Lubbock and I worked chains and uh, Brad was the uh, head linesman on that crew. Remember after one play, he turns to me and he's like, like, man, I hate down by contact. Hmm. I just remember that and kind of found it a little ironic after he got promoted to the NFL. Yeah, I think we had a conversation about down by contact uh, last week, and uh, I think we want to use the term forward progress. Oh, yeah, yeah, for us. But this was back uh, – I think this was probably the only level he was calling at that time because I want to say he – I mean, this was like probably 15 years ago or so. I think he was out – I want to say he was calling out of the Pac-10 at that time. Yeah, no, that was what we had in our our uh, NCAA discussion, uh, the whole down by contact versus forward progress. Go ahead and explain that forward progress. Yeah. But it, was, it was just funny to have him, uh, you know, I, I, I remember that when he just turned to me that one time. I was like, man, I hate down by contact. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, 15 years later, I see him get promoted up into the NFL. Yeah, let's see what he says about that one, huh? <laughs> Hey Todd, how do you know Brad? How do you know uh, Mr. Rogers? Well, I think he's on actually. <laughs> um, but I met Brad last year about this point in time. Uh, Eastern had a scrimmage going on in Clovis at our high school field there, and they were short officials from the Lone Star, so Tim had called some people, and so I was lucky enough, and me and uh, Evan. Baker and Nick Holmes, we all joined in and, and got in, in line with those guys. And sure sure enough, uh, Brad was showed up in Clovis, New Mexico on a, I think it was a Thursday night. And uh, most incredible, humble guy you're going to ever meet. You think Land's humble. The man is, I, if I'm right, I think he's on, but he's not going to talk. So. <laughs> but he's a very incredible guy that um, reached out to me and him and I have been in contact phone calls, texts over the last year has been incredible. Um, he is 
he is an amazing man to, to just sit down and talk to and just about philosophy. And that was something I was going to ask you guys if there was something particular you wanted from him um, to be able to, to do that. Um, you know, if he was listening today, I'm not sure if he was or wasn't, but, you know, if, you know, it would be able to help him out to create his, his presentation. But, you know, it's a lot about philosophy and what, what is a foul, you know, he can present about anything. I mean, I've spent three hours with the guy in his Lubbock classroom, just watching film and talking football. And the man loves talking football and just a good guy. So cool. whatever can, you guys the, want to do. We can create the PowerPoint or he can have his own PowerPoint, well, whatever. Just let us know. We're going to let him create everything yeah. he wants to talk about. Yeah, he's got he's got lots of film. He's got lots of, of training video that, that he has shared with me some. You know what I mean? A little bit throughout the, this time with me because he's kind of, I mean, I – it was weird. I kind of asked him to mentor me for this college part of it because the Lubbock chapter is pretty strong. I mean, you got guys that are out of the SEC, um, Lone Star, you know, you know, on my college journey right now. And so that's that's been a good help, you know, to know him. And there's there's guys like Marcus Thornton that did the Division One national or Division Two national championship this year. That's just from Amarillo, Texas. He's also a guy that I asked for simple questions about college stuff and you know these guys are they're legit and the way cfo you remember at the cfo uh, thing in dallas in january they said they don't hire assholes or they don't hire jerks you know what i mean and so all of these guys are approachable and very very uh willing to share because they were with us you know they can remember um stories about when they were calling in new mexico because you got to remember uh brad Kind of grew up in New Mexico in a sense. Um, he was in the Dallas area. His family was, was there for a while. And then they ended up in Texas and, and moved around from there. But yeah, he's got a story. It's just funny that we share stories about New Mexico coaches with him every once in a while. He goes, yeah, there was a guy at New Mexico Military Institute. And so it was it was pretty funny that we both had, had the same hardest coach that we worked with as the same guy. <laughs> you know, and this guy's worked with, again, uh, worked with Nick Saban and, you know, Left Miles and all of those guys you see on Saturday. But if you'll just email me and tell me, guys, what you want to know from him, because he's kind of going to ask me for for some information that maybe he would like to share stuff that we want to we want to talk about. But that's fine. Well, uh, guys, guys have been texting and emailing Dennis and myself, so we'll we'll get the group collective uh ideas on what you know some topics and we'll get to yeah and i yeah. and i sat through his um his presentation that he gave at the lone star clinic in january um that's where me and um dave langley and hector martinez met him at the, the spring clinic for the lone star and so i have a few ideas just from what his presentation was um and his on-field mentorship was and what he talked about back in January. So I'll shoot you some ideas after uh, Ken um, gives me his and uh, then he could pick. And just like what Land did, he just talked about what was in his heart and uh, what he thought was important for us. So, All right, guys, let's wrap it up. We try not to ever go past an hour. Yep. Uh, uh, a lot of you guys that stuck around, thank you, Mickey, Scott, you know, all the rest of you guys, appreciate it. Um, you guys take care, stay healthy, peace.